Welcome back to Black Cat Crypto Club. Crypto markets are moving up today. So we are going to look into some of the things in the news that may be contributing to this, as well as things going on with Bitcoin ETFs, as well as the Ethereum ETFs. Now, I also had a few questions come in um, in the comments of some previous videos that I do want to address. So stick around. There is going to be a lot of really good information in this video that you guys are not going to want to miss. But before we get into all of that, guys, as always, if you could, if you have anything at all to spare, please go over and show these guys a little bit of support. This is for them, Animal, animal Sanctuary. Um, these guys take in abused and abandoned animals, uh, rescues, and whatnot and these guys do a terrific job so guys i do have the link to their uh this website that i'm showing you guys right now in all of the videos uh in all of the descriptions to the videos this entire month so find their link in the description go over and show them some love you can also just type it into your browser it is for the number four themsanctuary.org go over there and even even if you can just spare a dollar i mean that really goes a long ways for these small sanctuaries that i'm bringing to you guys every month so um as you can see on this the very front page of their their website you can find their paypal right here as well as their patreon down below as well as up above um, so go over, show them some support, go over and check out their uh, social media. They are a 501c nonprofit, so anything you donate really um, helps you and them as well. So let's uh, show them some support, guys. But, but um, the first thing that I wanted to touch on was a comment that I got, and I got asked how to read charts and understand candles. So let's hop over uh, back over to the charts on TradeView. Now, guys, if you don't have TradeView, this is a free app that you can download on your phone. And it works a little bit differently on mobile than it does here on, on desktop. But the first thing that you'd probably want to look at is the time frame on what you are looking at. Um, now on right here, the, what I've got pulled up, this chart is for Bitcoin. Now you can switch between, you can load all kinds of different coins. I've got Bitcoin, Ethereum, Solana. I've got mobile token, Pith, Render, uh, ADA, Cardano. I've, I even have like silver and gold in here. DXY is the dollar, um, which is not doing so hot lately which is also a good thing i mean bitcoin tends to do well when the dollar goes down so uh that's another reason why lately we've been kind of trending a little bit upwards in bitcoin but let's just hop over back over to bitcoin um now you guys can do all kinds of stuff in TradeView. You can put in these trend lines like I have here. Um, and really, you know, the first step is just kind of going over and just playing with it, you know, go in and, and put in a few lines for yourself and just see how the price reacts to kind of what you've put in there. You know, like right here, you can see I've put this trend line, this top trend line, uh, right at the top of this this red candle that we topped out at right there. And then I just pulled it down um, so it hit this next candle and just went there. And, and then I just put another trend line along the bottom, uh, you know, and just followed. Usually you want to hit two or three points. So I hit this point here, this point here, this point here was really close and then i just extended those all the way out until they touched and you guys can see that you know this this really kind of played out pretty nicely it it went right in and went upper 
bounds and lower bounds of this triangle until we broke out two days ago. So, uh, you know, the first thing is just kind of getting in and playing around with it, you know, draw some, draw some lines. You can also add indicators uh, like the RSI and the stochastic RSI like I have down here. But there's all kinds of indicators. I would like to do a full video for you guys. There are a few indicators um, that I really watch besides these, uh, like the stochastic RSI, that are very good at signaling when we're getting close to a top, a cycle top. So I do want to do a video, guys, and show you guys those indicators so you guys can take those settings and you can load them into your own trade view and just kind of keep an eye on it yourselves. So if you do want to see that video, guys, make sure you hit the notification button on right next to the thumbs up of this video. And that way you won't miss that video where I'm going to share with you guys all of the settings and the indicators that I watch for when it comes to cycle tops. So make sure you do that. Now, guys, you can with TradeView, like I said, you can switch in between day. So this is the daily chart right here. You have that D, which means that every candle here is one day. Now you can go up here and adjust that all the way down to the minute, which is pretty pointless. I, on my phone, I usually watch the hourly chart. We can switch over to that really quick. Um, but this just kind of gives me an idea because I'm obsessed and I check on the charts way too often. Uh, but the hourly kind of shows me a little bit better what we've done the last four or five hours rather than just watching the day. But the daily chart does usually this is the chart that you kind of want to um, really do any like technical analysis on uh, just because it gives you a little bit better idea of what's going on a little bit longer term. The other things that you need to really get into when you're doing any kind of like reading the charts is you've got to know kind of the patterns that play out when you're when you're talking about chart analysis. Now, the first one that I'll just show you guys is right here. We had this this pull. And then this flag that came off of it. Now, that's what's referred to as a bull flag, and you can kind of see that Usually this plays out to the upside like we're doing right now. Uh, so that's a perfect example. An even bigger bull flag we've been in is all the way back here <laughs> to like January. We had this pull up and then we had we've been flagging all the way down and now we're breaking up to this upside. So both of those bull flags are really playing out pretty nicely. But that's, that's just one um, kind of pattern that really plays into chart analysis. Another one is like a inverted head, head and shoulders, which you can kind of see right here. Um, let me just get this out a little bit. But you can kind of see this is a shoulder, and then we've got a head here. And of course, this is inverted head and shoulders. So we've got a shoulder here, a head here, and a shoulder here. And usually when this happens, we've got a neckline, right? About actually the neckline was up here towards this uh, first shoulder. But what happens is once you start seeing this head and shoulders play out, what usually happens is once we break this neckline, we start shooting up, which that's playing out just as as much uh, as the the bull flags are. So there's a lot of a lot of uh, patterns that you got to watch like that. But I'd say probably the easiest way to kind of learn those patterns, you know, you can do a lot of reading and whatnot, but it's probably easier just to watch other 
really good uh, chart analysis. Um, and I don't do a ton of, of technical analysis on the charts with Bitcoin. Every once in a while, I like to get in here and kind of share with you guys what I'm seeing. But there are a few that I really like to watch. Uh, one is uh, Crypto Zombie on YouTube. He has some really good um, enter entertaining videos and his chart analysis is one of my favorites, to be honest. Um, and then Scott Milker also does a lot of char chart analysis and technical analysis. So if you guys want to go over and check those guys out, they they do a terrific job in uh, technical analysis. So go over, just kind of immerse yourself. If you do want to get into reading the charts, the best way to do that and learn these patterns without indicators is just to kind of dive in and start watching other people and start learning about these pat patterns that they're talking about and they're seeing. Um, so yeah, guys, just if you don't have trade view, go over and download that and just start playing with it. Just put in some lines and, you know, that's what I did. I started doing is I just started putting in lines where I, I saw, you know, tops happening and I just kind of watched how it played out and it will surprise you, you know, how many times the price will go right to the line that you've you've put in there and turn around. You know, it's it's kind of amazing. So that said, uh, the second part of the question was where I like to access data such as inflows and Bitcoin shorts. So the first um, the first source that I want to show you guys is over here on Twitter. Now, this is HODL 15 Capital. And these guys put out terrific uh, ETF information. So go over to, to Twitter, search for HODL 15 Capital. Guys, whenever you're dealing with these big big names in crypto or anything really, and they're on Twitter, you really need to look for this blue check mark because that there, once you're so big, once you're big enough to influence people, um, guys, you're, you're going to have to look for this blue check mark because there are so many fake scam accounts. And I don't know why, Twitter isn't better about cracking down on that. I think it's partially because they like the money that comes with these blue check marks that they're selling to people. But just make sure who, who you're following is the real deal. Um, so HODL15, they have these daily threads and it'll always look like this. It'll have the date and then it'll say Bitcoin ETF and have this logo. But this, guys, they have tons of charts on all of the information um, with the ETFs that are super informative. So that is a very good source. Another good source uh, for everything ETF wise is James Seifert and Eric Balchunas. Now, these guys are um, the the Bloomberg analysts um, that really covered the Bitcoin ETFs really well. So these guys are really down to earth, very active on Twitter. I've actually talked with them uh, back and forth a little bit here and there, and they're they're just down to earth, very, um, very friendly. They'll tell you how it is. Uh, they'll often correct you. If you're not seeing exactly how ETFs work, so very informative. They're not really biased one way in another, uh, one way or another, in my opinion. Um, but you can see here, uh, James Safer, his handle is 
at J S E Y F F. Look for that check mark. But you've also got Eric Balchunas, and he is at Eric Balchunas, is his handle. Now, guys, if you want to follow me <laughs> on Twitter, I'm down here. Um, we'll just go to my profile really quick. I don't have the blue check mark because, guys, nobody's going to pretend to be me, at least not at this level. So, um, anyways, I am Black, uh, Black Cat Crypto, and my handle is at Drake P269. I have been sharing a little bit more of some things over here on Twitter uh, that I don't always share in my videos here. So, if you guys want to keep up with some things that I'm sharing over there, go over and follow me over there. I don't do a ton over there, but I have started using it a little bit more. So you can go over and check me out over there. As far as um, ETF inflows go, um, besides the HODL 15 capital, you can also use the coin market cap uh, app on your phone. I pulled it up on the desktop, but I couldn't find the ETF flows like it is um, in my phone. I just couldn't find it. So if you guys download the mobile app of coin market cap, um, let's see if I can show you guys this. This is the home page here, and you've got this this little bar of of different tabs here. You've got coins, watch list, overview. If you go to the overview and just scroll down, you've got the fear and greed index there. Um, but right under that, you have Bitcoin ETF tracker. Now guys, look at this. We, ha we now have 16 straight days of Bitcoin ETF inflows. And yesterday's was gigantic. We almost had $900 million worth of inflows into the ETFs just yesterday. So another big sign that things, good things are in, in, the, in the workings. Um, now, I do... Um, as far as uh, the, the ETFs go, that is kind of my, my main source. As far as the Bitcoin shorts go and the, um, the charts that I kind of look at for that, there are several places that you can get that information. TradeView has some Bitcoin short, uh, shorts charts. So if you get into to Trade, TradeView, you just go over to the, the coins and search for a Bitcoin uh, shorts. That's what that one I don't use very much. Binance has a bunch of information on shorts on their platform. But my favorite one to watch, and this is the one that I showed you guys in that tweet yesterday. Uh, this is the liquidation heat map from uh, Coinglass. I'm going to jump over there. So this looks familiar if you guys watched my video yesterday. This is the heat map for Bitcoin to USDT uh, liquidation heat map. Now, the easiest way to find this um, is probably just to get into Google and Google Bitcoin short heat map. And probably the first or second one will be coin glass here. So you click on that. It'll bring you to this page. Now, guys, what's interesting is just in the last day since I showed you guys that uh, that last video, I want to zoom in here just a second. But you can see we have almost formed this new level of very concentrated shorts. And this level, uh, this right here, guys, Yesterday, we pretty much had this, this upper one right at about 74,000. We had this one at about 73,000. But guys, just since then, we've started forming this level of shorts, which is right at about 62,000. 
And that is about where we got rejected today. However, this is a dangerous game these short sellers are playing, guys, because once we break through that, now, now that first level is not at 73. All we have to do is break through 72 now, and it's going to be like a video game triple jump where Mario, you've got, you guys have played video games where you can kind of double jump off of air. <laughs> it's going to be a triple jump. Okay, we're going to break through this 62 uh, short level, and that's just going to propel us. Now, the reason why these levels propel us even harder is because when shorts are liquidated, guys, sh the short seller has to buy back the Bitcoin that he borrowed and sold, he or she or they or whatever, they have to buy that Bitcoin back when they're liquidated. So that just propels the, the price further up. So once this level, this $62,000 short level, once we bust that through that and those shorts are liquidated, it will just propel us up through this second level and that'll just be more liquidations there, which will propel us through this third level. It's going to be gigantic, okay? Uh, this, uh, this short squeeze just keeps getting better and better. Um, and it's, it is such a dangerous game that these short sellers are playing, but... Nobody's going to be crying for the short sellers, guys. These guys are... Uh, I don't know why you would short the best performing asset of all time, but um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of, this is my favorite chart for looking at short selling. Um, so coin glass, you can always just Google Bitcoin short heat map is what you want to look for. So um, now I want to jump over to the news of the day, and that is that Canada becomes the first nation to cut interest rates. Let me pull this over for you guys, this article. This is an article from Reuters, uh, but the Bank of Canada just decided to cut their interest rates, and they are the first G7 nation to cut their interest rates. So what this kind of shows is that global liquidity and money supply are just going to continue to increase in the near to medium term. And it's also a sign that the U.S. interest rate cuts could be coming sooner than later. Now, the way that Jerome Powell um, kind of described this a few weeks ago was that the U.S. could hold off on cutting rates longer than these other countries because our, our economy has been resilient. But all of the recent metrics that have come out have shown that our economy is dwindling more than Jerome Powell wanted to, to let on. Um, we had GDP coming in low uh, a month or so ago. Um, we had manufacturing just a few days ago coming in below expected. And we just saw yesterday or the day before job openings came in lower than expected as well. So all of that combined uh, with the latest inflation CPI readings uh, that came in lower, even those readings um, even though those readings were probably manipulated, the CPI, you know, they, they chose to exclude coffee, which definitely brought that down. Even though that's probably manipulated, all of those points um, coming together um, kind of shows that the Fed may be cut cutting interest rates. Now, why does that matter? Um, because when interest rates are cut, the proverbial money printers turn on, 
liquidity comes into the market and there are more um, there's more money floating around and it's available to come into markets like Bitcoin. But also when when we start printing money like that and we lower lower rates, that also is not very good for inflation. So inflation goes up and you know, Bitcoin doesn't have to do anything just to go up against the dollar. If the dollar is losing buying power and Bitcoin's just staying the same, Bitcoin will go up against the dollar. Um, but it also drives Bitcoin adoption because people are sick of their wealth being inflated away. So inflation's bad, but it will be good for the dollar or for Bitcoin. So you know, it is good for Bitcoin. Now, probably one of the biggest indicators that the Fed will uh, have to cut rates is that we keep seeing cracks emerging in the banking system. And I've kind of harped on this over and over, and I think that's probably the most important thing. But we keep seeing cracks opening up in the banking system. And a Above all, the Federal Reserve will act to protect the banking system and confidence in the banking system. Now, there are still a bunch of analysts that are saying that we won't get any rate cuts this year, but more and more I'm, I'm seeing uh, there are analysts that are thinking that we will get rate cuts sooner, and some are claiming that we'll get our first rate cut in July, which is next month. A lot of those predictions are coming from analysts that cite the FDIC's report yesterday that I showed um, that showed um, that 63 banks are on the verge of collapse. So not good, not good for banking. Inflation's not good for anybody. But all of this is actually really positive for Bitcoin. If you're in Bitcoin, these are things that are going to drive adoption and drive the price up for the next 12 to 18 months. So before... Um, before I wrap up the video, I actually have a few more things I want to get into, but I want to touch on a few things with the Ethereum ETFs. Now, first of all, every, everything points to the Ethereum, um, uh, the Ethereum ETFs launching towards the end of the month. All of the applicants are getting their finalized S1 forms. BlackRock just came in a few days ago with their final S1 form and resubmit it to the SEC. And so it's pretty widely accepted that we will see these Ethereum ETFs go live by the end of June this month. Now, the second thought that I had this morning was about how weird the entire Ethereum ETF situation really has been. Going back a sev uh, like several months, I you know, probably when I pretty close to when I started this video, this, this channel, um, you know, my position was that the Ethereum ETFs would uh, be approved mainly on the basis that the SEC lost their court case over denying spot Bitcoin ETFs. And yet at the same time, approving Bitcoin ETF futures. Uh, future ETFs, excuse me, uh, which is exactly the same position that Ethereum ETFs were in. You know, we already had the Ethereum ETF futures. So why would the SEC want to go to court when they knew that they were going to have another lawsuit if they denied these? And they knew that they were probably going to lose that court case probably spend millions of taxpayer dollars fighting this thing that they would they knew that they would probably lose. Uh, but as time went on, 
we saw the SEC starting an investigation against the Ethereum Foundation. Uh, we saw the SEC serve Consensus or Met MetaMask, as well as Uniswap with Wells notices, which means that they're going to bring a lawsuit against those en entities. So once we saw all of that, it just seemed clear that the SEC was still very hostile and would probably not approve the ETFs. Now, I want to show you guys a video of Hester Pierce. Now, this just came out a few days ago uh, since the Ethereum ETFs have been approved. Um, and she is one of the five SEC commissioners. And this is what she had to say about the SEC approving Ethereum ETFs, guys. Listen in to this. Um, here we go. I got to ask you about the approval of the spot Ether ETF. You can't be here and us not ask about <laughs> what happened. It really felt like nothing was going to happen. There was sudden movement at the agency, a lot of speculation going on about what was happening behind closed doors. What happened? I mean, I think that it's not that surprising of a development when you think about the, the, legal history that we the recent legal history that we had with um being told that our approach to the bitcoin etp was not consistent with the law um and then when you you line up the the eth etp alongside the bitcoin etp the facts are very similar i wouldn't want to have us have a similar legal opinion coming out of a judicial opinion coming out of the court so from my perspective, we didn't really have a whole lot of choice, just as we didn't have a whole lot of choice on the Bitcoin ETP. I know the timing, people were wondering what would happen and when it would happen, but realistically, we didn't have that many options. Okay, so you can see Hester there reiterating um, exactly what I thought months ago, but it really begs the question that if this is what the SEC's thoughts were all along, then why did they bring all of these regulatory actions against Ethereum entities and Ethereum projects right before the Ethereum ETF deadlines? And it's very interesting because even though the SEC served MetaMask and Uniswap with Wells notices, I mean, they, they did this a little over a month ago now, is when they served these Wells notices, but they still haven't filed a lawsuit against either of them. Now, comparatively, guys, back last year when the SEC brought lawsuits against uh, Coinbase and Binance, when they served Coinbase and Binance with Wells notices, it was only about a week and a half later that they filed suit against them. So what's going on with these other uh, things with MetaMask and Uniswap? It seems like they, they, they've either decided that they're not going to pursue that or I don't know what. Now, in my thinking, there's probably three possibilities going on here. One is that since the SEC has approved the Ethereum spot ETFs, they've effectively deemed Ethereum as a commodity, not a security. Okay, so um, when it's when Ethereum's not a security, maybe now the SEC is now realizing that with that designation, that their case against these Ethereum projects are just not practical and they will not end up pursuing, like I said, a lawsuit against MetaMask and Uniswap. Now, two, uh, the, the second situation could be that the SEC continues to claim that despite Ethereum being a commodity, that the services that Uniswap and MetaMask provide constitute a security contract which 
I think is a pretty big stretch considering both projects, MetaMask and Uniswap, don't really offer any service. You know, there it's much more just computer code. You know, one MetaMask is a self-custody wallet. There's not really a service there. They don't have they're not like a bank where they're custodying it for you. This is a, a program, a computer code that allows you to store your own Ethereum and cryptocurrency, right? So it's not really a service. Um, and the other being Uniswap, which is just a decentralized exchange. It's not a service. It's not something they're providing. This is just a program that allows people to exchange cryptocurrencies. So I think that's a pretty big stretch, um, but you never know. You never know the bounds of the SEC sometimes. Now, the third option is, and this is just kind of for fun, guys. This is just pure speculation here. Um, not sure how much weight this actually holds, but it also wouldn't surprise me. Um, if someone like, let's say, BlackRock didn't want as much anticipation around the spot Ethereum ETFs. So um, effectively, they would want to keep the prices down until as close as possible to the approval. Now, if you believe that BlackRock has as much power as some people say, then the SEC playing lapdog for BlackRock and filing all of these enforcement actions to scare people and sway people's opinions away from thinking that Ethereum would be approved kind of makes sense. Now, again, I'm not sure how much that holds weight, but one thing I don't buy into is that the SEC always held the opinion that they would have to approve these ETFs, like Hester was saying. I just, I don't think they, they hold that position and go after all of these ETH projects right before the deadline. Just that doesn't make sense to me. So who knows? I guess we'll have to wait and see if the SEC actually follows through on suits against Ethereum Foundation, MetaMask, and, and Uniswap. Um, but guys, there is, there's a lot of people uh, that are thinking that Ethereum ETFs won't do as well as Bitcoin. Now, maybe that's the case, a lot of people are saying they're they're just going to flat out flop, which I don't think that's the case at all. And in fact, I almost think there's more um, more possibility that out um, that Ethereum outperforms the Bitcoin ETFs. Now, the reason why I say that, guys, is that I think a lot of these big institutions and banks and big money actually see more utility and use with Ethereum than they do even with Bitcoin. Now, this is actually seen by one of the big Bitcoin ETF, one of the uh, big naysayers, and that's JP Morgan. You know, JP Morgan and Jamie Dimon, Dimon himself, the CEO, came out hard against Bitcoin and these ETFs, but they are all about tokenized real world assets, which is exactly what Ethereum does. You know, that is exactly what Ethereum and DeFi is, is tokenization, smart contracts, and, um, you know, tokenizing real world assets. Now, JP Morgan has their own blockchain for this. If you didn't know, it's called Onyx and they plan on doing this themselves. But 
the difference between Onyx and something more digital or decentralized like Ethereum is Onyx's system is you're going to always have that centralization issue and it's not going to be as permissionless as Ethereum is. So there is that. Now I want to get over to another, this is the last video I'm going to show you guys today, but this is Larry Fink. And this was right after Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin ETF was approved. And this is exactly what he said. He instantly started, you know, going away from talking about Bitcoin, really, and really got into the tokenization of real world assets. So listen in to this video, guys. Longer term, do you now expect other cryptocurrency ETFs? Meaning, do you think that Gary, and we'll talk to him later, uh, Gary like Ethereum. Will, have, will have to approve an Ethereum yeah. ETF. And is that a function of something the SEC has to do? Or do you think that all these things have to go to court first? I couldn't respond to that. I, I, I see value in having an Ethereum ETF. As I said, these are just start stepping right. stones towards tokenization. And I, I really do believe this is where we're going to be going. We have the technology to tokenize today. If you want to talk about, think about this. If you had a tokenized right. security, and you have a tokenized identity, right. you, Andrew, the moment you buy or sell an instrument, it's known. It's an, on a general ledger right. that is all created together. Um, you want to talk about issues around money laundering and all that. This eliminates all corruption by having right. a tokenized system. Jamie Dimon disagrees with you on that, but. Jamie Dimon disagrees with you on that. I don't think Andrew Sorkin, the host here, uh, was correct in that because D Jamie Dimon is all about tokenizing real world assets. That's why they've spent millions of dollars on their own blockchain to do so. But you can see here, guys, Larry Fink was super excited about this prospect. And in my opinion, getting into the Bitcoin ETF was just kind of a, a way to get their foot into the door for the real product product. And that is the way to tokenize real world assets. We already see that BlackRock is doing this, guys. They, they have a project called Biddle that they utilized Ethereum's blockchain. And basically what it is, is it's a, a tokenized real world asset for a basket of treasuries and bonds and whatever. And it offers their customers a yield on their investment. Um, so you can you can already see BlackRock is like jumping into this head first. But this is the reason I kind of think that Ethereum ETFs will actually do better than the Bitcoin ETFs. Now, I don't know, guys, it I could be wrong there, but I think I think big money has much more use for Ethereum and DeFi. It takes a lot of that friction out like uh, Larry Fink was saying there, it makes things a whole lot more honest, takes out a lot of fraud. And I don't know, I think this is the play for big institutions, which kind of is ironic because it does cut a, cut a lot of those middlemen out, but it also makes things a whole lot less friction um, you know, a lot less frictious, I guess, um, in their everyday operations. So it actually helps a lot of these institutions out while eliminating others. So I don't know, guys, I guess we'll have to wait and kind of see what happens with the ETH, ETH, Ethereum ETFs, uh, going live this month. It wouldn't be surprising if we saw a bit of a dip, just like we did with Bitcoin going live on their ETFs. We do have Grayscale that has an Ethereum trust, just like they did with the Bitcoin thing. And that is where we saw a lot of outflows in the early days. So 
Does that happen again with Ethereum ETFs? I'm not sure. This could be why their CEO just resigned a few weeks ago, right the same day that these ETFs were approved, I believe. Um, because I think he screwed up. I think Grayscale and, and their CEO screwed up by keeping their rates so high. So does him exiting um, as CEO kind of, I don't know, does that signal that we maybe see Grayscale pivot on, on being more competitive? competitive? Guys, I am having a hard time talking today. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they have to. I think they've maybe learned their lesson and they'll come in a little more competitive with their Ethereum ETF. I think it'd be crazy if they didn't. Let's just say that. So I don't know. I guess uh, time will will be the judge and we will we'll see what happens at the end of this month when they do go live. But guys, if, if you guys liked any of this video, make sure you like, subscribe, and hit the bell notification down below. Um, I will be doing that future video on uh, the indicators in the charts that I will be uh, showing you guys how to use those and how you'll be able to keep an eye on it, on things a little bit better yourself. Um, but yeah, guys, hit the like button and remember to go over and help for them Animal Sanctuary. And I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.